mentioned some of the rock forces were in the Republic of Korea, right? South yeah. Korea. Did you, and you worked with them a bit? I didn't right? personally work with them, oh. but they, they had a reputation of being yeah. Very tough. tough. <laughs> they were tough. And not so interested in the rules. They weren't so much interested in anything that I, could, that I understood other than killing the VC. Yeah. I mean, and they were hardcore and they were tough. Yeah. They didn't take prisoners in. Yeah. Every, every, everybody I've talked to says the same thing, that the, the, the rocks were tough. But it is a reminder that the U.S. wasn't the only country there. No, there were Australians, there were Brits that were there. Um, there were a, a number of New Zealanders. Yeah, yeah, New Zealanders. Thai, Filipinos. Yeah, so it was an, it was an international thing, though obviously the U.S. was the was the, the key the key force there. You mentioned the uh, the civilian irregular defense groups, the CIDGs, and you say that they would need FOs. Who 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 are these folks? The CIDGs, uh, they were tra trained by the snake eaters. <laughs> snake <laughs> eaters were the Green Beret guys, mostly over in uh, in Van Tien and over in that area. Uh, a lot of the civilian irregular defense groups would have the uh, the Green Berets come into their village, and they made they made fortified villages because it really wasn't working out real well to have. I mean, we were displacing a lot of people. Uh, just about had to fighting a guerrilla war, and we had back when I was there, we had free fire zones. Tell us what that means. Pre -fire. A free fire zone is an area where all the civilian populace has been removed, and if you're there, you're going to get shot. So if you see a Vietnamese person in a free fire zone, he is the enemy. enemy. Yeah, period. Yeah. He is the enemy. In a lot of cases, that was the case. But what they would do is they would, they would build a village and fortify it a large village, and they would bring these outlying villages in to that fortified village, and that was their new home. Well, these people have been living in that village, they're, they're ten generations back, you know, in, in a certain place, and we're uprooting them and sending them into a fortified village. <clears throat> um, it wasn't real popular. It was, it was, yeah. it was, it was kind of a I think a last resort, what are we going to do, you know, to get this? Because yeah. during the day, the VC would be out plowing the field and waving at you and everything. It's AKs laying underwater down in, in the paddy because those things fire, you could pack them with mud and they'd fire. But at nighttime, they were out there hunting Americans. The, we used to say the night belongs to Charlie, and uh, that was pretty much the case. Uh, it was, yeah. See, this was before we had FLIR and all of these night, uh, night vision, density, night vision yeah. uh, equipment. We were basically blind at night. At night, we hunkered down. Yeah. That's and set up a, a defensive perimeter. Take long to realize that when you come into a village and you're taking this village and there's nobody there except old men, old women, and children. Mysteriously, all the 20 year old guys are gone. Oh, yeah, there's not a 20 year old guy to be found anywhere. I <laughs> mean, because they're all with the VC, they, they are all in. You know, in a lager somewhere, mm -hmm. hunkered down during the day and prowling at night. Yeah. But on the other hand, a lot of times when we bring people into these four or five villages, uh, you didn't know who you were getting, and you would get serious VC sympathizers uh, in into your village, and they would do things like mark off how far it is to your ammunition dump or to uh, your headquarters and that kind of thing. And they would get messages out to the outside because they weren't like in a walled city. They went out to their caddies yeah. during yeah. the day. Yeah. But uh, they would get messages out and give them all of this detailed information and then you take mortars at night 
right on top of your position. So all of a sudden, a, a 10 year old boy or a 10 year old girl or a 90 year old man or a 90 year old woman is an intelligence operator exactly. for the VC. And that's why. I don't know who you can trust. I, you know, that's why it came to a point where, regardless of how you, you felt when you got there, it didn't take long before you didn't trust anybody. Well, so then that leads me to okay, what about these guys? What about the, the, the Sidgies? Did, did you Sidgies, did these you guys have proven them? themselves. They, I mean, yeah. these, they were loyalists. Um, now, were these ethnic minorities within Vietnam? The Montagnards were, and there were others. We dealt, I dealt, Strict, uh, all I ever dealt with were Montagnards, the city forces from the Montagnards. And that's a strange thing too. The Montagnards despise the Vietnamese. The Montagnards are basically a tribal people that, you know, they live back up in the central highlands and everything. The only people they despise worse than the Vietnamese are the Chinese. And they joined us and they were excellent. I mean, the, you talk about bushcraft, these guys could could glide through the, the bush like nothing. It was nothing to them. They were good. So this was this was an ethnic, ethnic minority that had sort of a, a, a long-standing historical dislike for the Vietnamese. And so they see you guys, and maybe they don't care about communism or capitalism, but this is a chance to take it to our historic foe well, here. And you know... They have a whole society. They have beautiful villages up on stilts and make some yeah. of the most gorgeous baskets that you've ever seen in your life that they weave. Uh, and they just they just want to be left alone. And what the, what was happening is the VC were come, the South Vietnamese pretty much left the yards alone, left them up in their territory and didn't bother, didn't even try and collect taxes from them. So they didn't care about South Vietnamese. But the VC, the North Vietnamese, and, and all of the Viet Cong were coming in, taking their young men and impressing them into service mm. in their fighting forces. So they had a huge hatred for the Viet Cong. Did the environment bother them? No. So, yeah, us, so make, sure. us making them wear the uniforms that we made them wear, they didn't much care for. But other than that, I mean, they would have been perfectly happy with a loincloth uh, doing the same thing. Yeah. It would have, it would have been fine with them. Did you ever feel like you were slowing the Montagnards down? Only when we were with them. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I mean, when we would when we would hit an LZ, they'd be like spiders. I mean, they'd be, <laughs> LZ's landing zone. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. landing zone. Yeah, they would be they'd be gone before we could get off the helicopters. Oh, you mean the monster airplanes? Oh yeah, they'd be, in, they'd be out. And an LZ usually it was a blasted out place. Rarely a a patty or anything like that. Usually it was where. We had come in and, and dropped some ordnance to clear a place because all I fought in were up in the central highlands. So it was all yeah. mountains and valleys. Yeah. But we usually landed on the mountains and then went down to the valleys and came out. And yeah, they would they would as soon as they hit the ground, they were out of that cleared area. They were smart. Uh, yeah. And and they they really were friendly. They liked Americans. Unless you were doing something really dumb that might get them killed. Mm -hmm. And they'd let you know in a heartbeat about that. Yeah. Now, we mentioned a, a, a little bit ago that the ROCs, the mm -hmm. Korean troops, uh, the consensus is that uh, they weren't very interested in Geneva Conventions and, and things like that. How about our, how about our Montagnard friends? <laughs> they were worse than the ROC. <laughs> we had to keep a tight leash on them, yeah. yeah. Because even though, like, with, a lieutenant in the Sigis would be in charge of the Sigis. We were ultimately responsible uh, yeah. for their behavior. We could not be going out and have them decapitating people and cutting ears off and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we had to keep a pretty tight leash on. Yeah. Now, what, what aside from, you know, fighting their traditional adversaries, what, did the Montagnards get any other incentives? What other incentives did they have, or, 
or was fighting the well, Vietnamese. That was it. They were just they were really upset because their young men were being kidnapped by the BC and a lot of their villages were being ransacked, their rice was being taken from them, their pigs were being taken from them. You know, it was yeah. it was that more than anything else. They had no particular care about Americans one way or another. America was a totally foreign concept. Incredible weight you guys had to carry, and the the heat and the humidity. What would you say would the typical temperature be? Uh, Hovering around 100 degrees. Yeah. Now up in the mountains, about up to 100. Uh, up in the mountains, you would get some breeze, and uh, I was there during the rainy season over the winter. Yeah. So, but it was still hot. I mean, it was. It was hot, but the humidity was a killer and, and no air movement. When you get the triple canopy or in the egress, either one, uh, there's just no air movement. You feel like you're suffering. You did not have jungle boots. We had plain old leather combat boots. And once they got wet, which was in about two minutes, they stayed wet. And you can only carry so many pairs of socks. Well, it doesn't matter when your boots are soaked, put on dry socks. Hello, you got wet socks. Yeah. And yeah. I still, right now, I'm going through a bout of it. I still have a, a fungus on my, uh, on my feet that periodically pops up and comes up almost to my knee. That never been able. I've been to a bunch of doctors, and they all said the same thing. <laughs> it's a fungus, man. It, and you know, they don't treat it. You can treat it topically. Yeah. I tried and, uh, so nickel silver uh, treatments, all kinds of stuff. And that goes back to the mm -hmm. Never had it before. Have you had any Agent Orange? No. Really? They weren't mm -hmm. using Agent Orange where I was oh, when that. I was there. Thank God. There. The first part of the war. Almost all of our NCOs, or senior NCOs, were veterans of Korea. They knew what they were doing. A large portion of the troops that were there were volunteers. Uh, the large numbers of draftees that got over there didn't want to be there to begin with hadn't taken place yet. So if I had to be there, I would... I would rather have been there when I was there than any other time during the whole conflict. Uh, we had good NCOs, but the majority of our officers were good officers, and you were you were fighting alongside other guys that that were also dedicated to what they were doing. I never smoked a joint until I came back to the states. I mean, it just wasn't done over there. Out in the field. We weren't even allowed to carry cigarettes with us because Charlie would smell that stuff about half a mile away. I mean, mm -hmm. No cigarettes or anything. That's the only time I ever chewed the back. Beach nut was furnished to us. And uh, we would chew tobacco. Those of us that smoked would chew tobacco when we were out in the field. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it was just a, a feeling of. Today is just like yesterday, and tomorrow will be just like today, and there's nothing being accomplished other than people are getting killed. Because mm. in World War II, you know, if we are tomorrow where the Germans are today, you've done something. We're winning. So we can take, take a hill, like we take a hill, take a village, whatever, and move on. If we took a hill and it cost us ten to fifteen guys to take this mountain. The next day, we were out of there, and they were right back. It was not a matter of, of holding territory. It was a matter of body counts. How many bodies can you account for today to hear you and kill? Because it was a battle of attrition yeah. rather than of territory. Believing that, you know, the term that's used is the crossover point, believing that we'll arrive at a crossover point where we'll, we'll, we'll kill it or disable... Yeah, more of them than they'll be able to replace, and at that point then. Exactly. But it turns out you're facing an enemy that is willing to just take 
I mean, just mind-boggling casualties. You you give the figures in in your memoir where you guys took you know real casualties, but nothing like what they took. No, no. And, no. He, and it's rational in sixty six, sixty seven to think, well, they're not going to keep this up. They can't continue to, to absorb this kind of punishment. But they well, not only that, uh, uh, the Ho Chi Minh uh, General Jap, uh, these men were not dumb. They followed the American news reports as closely or closer as anybody back here in the States did, and they could see what public opinion, where it was headed, where it was going, and they knew we don't have to outfight them. We don't have to kill more of them than they kill of us. All we have to do is hold on because they're going to get tired of it and they're going to lose. Was what is your feeling about you know the, the the young people who were your age, who were at Berkeley, who were at other universities, who were in you know they they you know somehow were able to avoid the draft. They got a deferment, something, um, and they're protesting. And now when you're there, that's not a big issue, mm -hmm. right? That really starts to grow. It was going on, but we were really aware of. Yeah, it's not it's not a big thing. What if he leaves out the bush? And right, yeah, so you didn't know about it. So I guess, you know, that really becomes an issue after you're wounded, after you come home. So you're aware of, it. you know, what thoughts did you have or do you still have about that? Uh, all I can say is if I've known then what I know now, I've probably been out there with him. And when I did get back, when I did get back, uh, to begin with, I was, I was kind of bitter. And I even joined with the VBAW. Uh, the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Really? I joined with them, went up to Washington, D.C., and protested during the, the big protest up there. Uh, so I was actively involved as far as just going up there and I, I took my uh, the medals that I had received and threw them over the White House. I was going to ask you if you did that. Yes, that I did. Yeah. I sure we did. Wow. You sent them back to me. <laughs> <laughs> they did. I had them. Yeah. It, was in, it was in a plaque uh, that the guys had made for me when I left and uh, it had my medals, my name and all this kind of stuff on it. Threw it over the wall. Well, it was a year. It may have been, may have been two or three years later. My father, because that's where my hometown address was. I didn't live in Atlanta anymore. But my father calls me up and says, "Chuck, oh, you've got a uh, package here from the Department of the Army." What for? <laughs> you know? And he said, "Well, I don't know." I said, "Well, open it and see." And he opened it up and he said, It's metals. Really? Mm -hmm. And he said, Yeah, it's it's metals. And they sent him back to me to my hometown address with this this letter saying that uh, the United States government appreciates your service honorably and your service in Vietnam. We regret the actions that you have taken and wish to return these earned medals to you. You know, something along that line, verbatim, but that's basically what it said. What was your reaction? <laughs> My reaction was, oh, God, that's really, really, you know, strange to do that, uh, to, to go to the trouble of, of sending it, you know, back. I had long since gotten away from all that kind of thing. I mean, I was busy being drunk, but mm -hmm. uh, and working. I never, I never missed a day of work. But from the time I got off work until the time I went to bed, I was drinking for years. I did that. Looking back, are you? Do you appreciate that gesture? Them sending they sent it back. back. Absolutely, I do. My son now has, you know, that plaque with my medals in it and everything. Otherwise. It, when you think back on that Vietnam veteran, Chuck Shiver, 
I'm amazed because I, you know, I was thinking oh, I'll ask you, did you carry medals? Don't ask, don't ask that's a stupid question, but you know, you did. You threw them. Um, when you think back on that, Chuck Shiver, you know, what was going on? And you kind of answered this question, but what was going on with that? It was at the White House, wasn't it? Was it close mm-hmm. to the White House? Yeah, it was at the White House. White House. So there you are, you know, throwing away your medals. What was going on with that guy? Anger. Just anger. There's so many lives have been lost for what I knew to be, from my viewpoint, a waste in whether it was deemed politically necessary or not, it was still a waste of human life and there was that I could see nothing to be gained from it. Uh, we were supporting a government that was not supported by its own people. It would have made a big difference on huh? had it's just I mean one of the Yeah, it would have made a huge tragedies. difference if the people had actually been struggling to be free of communism and, and, you know, there was a legitimate government there doing that. This is really one of the tough things of the war. You know, it's about going to the village and you find apparently VC stuff and so the village gets identified and... This one, is there one particular incident you can remember where this thing plays out? I mean, was there a sense at the time that even, wow, I really don't want to do this. I mean, Every time. you know, the village has been identified as VC, so we're going to burn, we're going to move the people out, burn the thing down. With rare exceptions, nobody really wanted to do that. There, there were some guys, there are always some guys, especially 19 years old, you got a lot of testosterone going for you. And there are some guys that got off on that, but mostly it was, okay, it's your company's turn burn the village because mm-hmm. they had to assign someone to do that and we call them Zippo raids. Zippo raids, yeah. Light them up. But nobody liked doing it because it's just it's pitiful to see these people. That, you know, a, a, an old woman who got no teeth and she's got a grandbaby with her and they've got a, a scroungy dog that they're gonna have to leave behind. They wouldn't put those on, on the helicopters. But you know, there may be a pig or two and a couple of chickens, and, and that's their, the stuff that they can pack on their back, get on their helicopter, and go to a fortified hamlet, and then you burn their place down. It was just, that's one of the things that, that really, as much as any of it, bothers me. I used to have a nightmare where I was in my grandmother's kitchen, which they had an old farmhouse down in South Georgia, a big old place, and I was in my grandmother's kitchen, and I knew that I had buried a bunch of Vietnamese under the floor of the kitchen and there were police coming in, and the police car, two or three police cars coming in the drive. Mm. And I'd wake up in a cold sweat from that. But it was, it was the destruction uh, that, that was just so horrific. People that all they wanted was just to, to live, just a life, you know? These people, they're, they're, they're trapped. A lot of them are trapped, right? They exactly. get hit from the VC on one side. Exactly. And they get, from they get the hit side. by the VC during the night and hit by us during the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, like, how, what kind of evidence did you need to find that the VC were there in order to burn the village? Because in your memoir, it's just that you found one SKS and a couple of rice. That's all it would take. Mainly it was the rice because typically they would not store rice. You can grow rice just about year round over there. And when you find big caches of rice, and I'm, by big caches, they'd have baskets this big around and that high. They'd have eight or ten of them in a cellar. That wasn't for the family and that wasn't for the, the hamlet because everybody had their own stores. When you found that, you found you were realizing that this was a supply line. And every place that, that I went over there, whether it was in uh, the Anlo or, or down in the Sukhoi Valley or wherever, these were all MBA through points from the Ho Chi Minh Trail over to the, the cities, over to the, the coastal areas. 
uh, we would a lot of times capture a number of weapons. Other times, one, you know, would be enough. But regardless of whether it was one or twenty, the village went up in flames and people got relocated. Look, uh, there was nothing clean about this war. Uh, as I said, this was a war of attrition. And you were judged how well you did by your body count. And there were a lot of goats that got counted as a body count. Yeah. A lot of pigs that got counted as a body count. And then, and then inflation, right? Because, well, if we counted four, they probably took some of the guys away. That's so right. There was always blood trails. And then the major needs to get lieutenant colonel, and so we'll add, we'll add 20 exactly. more. Yeah. It's no small thing to take a human arm. It's just this. And you know that what you're about to do, if you do what you're supposed to do, that you're going to take human lives. And I know it, it, it marked me for the rest of my life. Uh, I love to shoot. I've got a shooting range in my house. It only goes out to 300 yards, but I shoot a lot. I do not hunt. Mm -hmm. I do not like to kill anything. I capture spiders and take them out of the house. I just, it, it did something to me that that part will be with me the rest of my life. That will never change. And this was something that was, you were conscious of at the time. Yeah. That what, almost a, almost a you know, uh, forgive us for what we are about to do. Well, kind of it, it wasn't even put into words or thought so much as just a real sickening feeling mm -hmm. that, number one, am I going to be successful in what I've been trained to do? Number two, what are the consequences of, of my action going to be? Because it's easy enough to say, well, that's what I was trained to do, you know, orders are orders, definitely special. But at the same time, it comes down to, it's on you, you know, you're the one doing it. And I didn't pull the lanyard on, on the 105 or the 155 that uh, sent that missile, you know, seven miles down the valley and landed in the middle of a bunch of people. Yeah, I'm the one that initiated that. You sent them the coordinates. I sent them the coordinates and sent them the power orders. So it sounds like in your case, sometimes combat, actually I was just talking to a combat vet late last week, and you know, he says, look, battle is awful and all that. Uh, but he said, but it's also thrilling when that adrenaline gets going. There's oh, a, there's it a is. thrill. So, it you, is. so you, you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll put it like this, it was much less stressful to me when we were actually in combat with someone rather than giving coordinates to, to shell a village or to shell a, a, a truck concentration or whatever. That bothered me more because uh, when you're in, in close combat, it's you or them. I mean, they're right there. There is a tangible threat to you. Whereas if I'm here calling in coordinates, there's no tangible threat to me. Or even if there is, it isn't immediate. It's not in my face. Um, now, the adrenaline part of it, I admit, I thought that, I, you know, I used to race motocross, and I used to really be an adrenaline junkie for that. I, it was, I loved it. I never knew what an adrenaline rush was until I was in combat. There is, I mean, it, it was absolutely incredible. Your hear, first thing that goes is your hearing, but you can still hear all of the noise and everything. It's hugely loud, but at the same time, you become, you get tunnel vision. I mean, it's just right there. It was all, well, I think I, I wrote in that that I completely forgot after I turned the artillery loose where I was supposed to, and, and we got hit 
by infantry. I completely forgot about that artillery stuff. I mean, I was busy right there, you know, with my immediate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a totally different situation. And the, the next yeah. day, especially after that first firefight, well, the next day I didn't stop doing like that. I mean, all day, just all day, and, and so I went to sleep and just dead sound asleep. And when I woke up, I was still. Asleep. Looking at, at the quote from your memoir here, there's something about being shot at and having friends killed and wounded that draws you closer to your buddies. Do you still feel a sense of oh, camaraderie sure. when you see that guy with the Vietnam hat? Do you say anything? I always walk up and say, thank you so much for your service. Do you let them know that you're a Vietnam vet as well? Or? Sometimes it depends on what their response is. If they say, well, thank you. Yeah. And if they ask, I certainly do. I say, yeah, I was going to say yeah. Do you do anything to let folks know that you're being on that? Is that just a personal style thing, or no? It's just not part of my life. Um, this, all of this stuff was fifty-two years ago, and I was a totally different person at that time. Mm -hmm. Through the the. Loving ministrations of my my wife, my current wife, the wife of 28 years now. Uh, I came to know Jesus and uh, changed my whole life, everything about it. So, I mean, you just said it's not part of your life now, but yet. I mean, Vietnam never goes away, though. No, nope, right? I still have nightmares, and I still whack. The old lady occasionally, not on purpose. But the other night I rolled out of bed with my <laughs> Pomeranian was laying on my leg. I was asleep and something happened. I rolled out of bed and I have a, my, my other dog sleeps next to the bed. We both, and the covers and everything, piled out on top of the dog. It was hilarious, but it, the dream wasn't hilarious. You know, I, I still have nightmares. I still have bad dreams. 